I'm uh, uh, from the 447th Bomb Group, and I was radio operator gunner on a, a B-17, and uh, we named it the Ground Pounder, and there's a <laughs> there's more to the story on that one. Uh, but we uh, flew from uh, our first mission with 447th, uh, which was in uh, December, December 20th, 24th in 1943. And I did uh, complete my missions just before D-Day, 30 missions. Uh, that was uh, May 24th, 1944, when there was very little support, uh, fighter support. And they were based in uh, Rattleston, England, uh, Station 126. And it's uh, about uh, 70 miles northeast of London in East Anglia area. Pilot was uh, Charles Hopla. Oh, H O P L A. And he, he was short. <laughs> he was, uh, but we called him the old man because he was 24. So anyway, he was short. And uh, when we were just starting learning to fly, uh, we lost our pilot because uh, on that first flight after we uh, assembled as a crew, on that first flight our uh, pilot. Uh, as we were coming in to land, began to sneeze. <laughs> Turned out he had an allergy, so uh, he was benched and our little co-pilot took over as pilot and he turned out to be an outstanding pilot with one exception. He had to learn to land the B-17 because when the uh, tail went down, the nose went up and he couldn't see <laughs> over the nose, so we bounced. But he was so good uh, as, as a pilot every other way that uh, we, we had the honor of uh, receiving the first uh, B-17G in the, uh, our squadron, uh, 708. So uh, with uh, that, uh, then they asked us, well, what are you going to name your plane? And we looked at each other and we just couldn't come up with the name, but we remembered one thing and that was Hoppy trying to land. By this time, he's the best lander in the, in the business, but at the uh, time, uh, we said, well, let's call it Ground Pounder, <laughs> in, in, in reference to Hoppy's memory. Uh, normally, we were assigned, but uh, too often, if it was damaged, it was not ready for you if you were going to fly the next mission. So we, uh, we, had, uh, we had backup airplanes. Oh yes, I could uh, see there were plenty. Beginning with uh, uh, number two, our second mission was to uh, Kiel, and uh, we, uh, <laughs> if you don't remember, uh, uh, the B-17 is completely open. There's no windows, uh, there's windows, but no glass in the windows. And so uh, we get up there and uh, we're wearing the sheepskin coats. They're supposed to be warm, but they weren't warm. We froze, and we were seriously fro uh, frozen. Our ball turret gunner, we never saw him again. When we landed, he froze his feet so bad, they, uh, they had to hospitalize him and then discharge him from the military. So uh, the rest of us uh, were all badly frostbitten. Every place that was exposed, and for me, that was primarily around my goggles, which we were wearing, my helmet, which we were wearing, but everything had welts wherever you were exposed. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, that was uh, number two. Well, as we went on, we went, um, we went into that push week, which was between February 20th and 25th of uh, 44. And uh, during that time, we were putting the final cap on all of uh, uh, Hitler's supply manufacturing. We were just getting it all. But on the fifth one, 25th of, uh, of February, <laughs> we were shot out of we, we were shot out of formation. We had lost two engines, and on the uh, um, we had to, we found a secondary target we could drop our bombs on. We didn't just drop them; we dropped them on a target. But on the way back, we had to drop down. We dropped out of our formation. We had to drop down to about 12,000 feet rather than our 24. And on that mission, we were jumped by four fighters that came at us. We, uh, uh, uh oh, you know, but uh, they were German MEs, 
ME 109s. But they came too close to us. They were a shooting target. So as soon as they got close to us, we shot two of them down right away. And the other two then went out in front of us, and they were out there for about five, ten minutes, I guess, when uh, 20 more joined them. So now we have 22. And they came at us the same way. They came up close, and we shot two more of those down, so we had four now. And then uh, as we uh, uh, just about thought we'd had it, two P-47s going in the opposite direction must have been lost. I, I don't know their names. I don't want to, I'd love to know their names, but I wouldn't want to get them into trouble. But they were out there. They were planted there for some reason. God took, ter uh, took charge of this situation because we, sh we saw them and uh, we put up a flare and they came around and the Germans scattered. Those 22 Germans or 20 left scattered. So uh, we escorted them back and we es they escorted us back. We had coverage all the way back with two P-47s. They were, they were f deathly af afraid of the P-47. It was such a tremendous fighting plane once it's in the air. You know, it's such a heavy nose, they call it the jug, but it was an outstanding fighter. I, I used to watch those dogfights out my little window in my, my radio room, and uh, you could see the P-47 was so dominant. So I, I was pleased to have those in their, our side. And then we started getting the P-51s in too, so that gave us a lot of good support. Well, anyway, we're just uh, moving along. Uh, we, uh, by the way, we landed safely and we were fine. I, I, I will say this, though. Uh, we were badly shot up, it, it, not only the bullets, but also the flak. And so I went out to the, see the crew chief the next day, find out how many holes we had. And uh, when I asked him, he says, well, I stopped counting at 2,000. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure about the accuracy, but he, uh, you know, that's how many uh, it looked like we had. But anyway, uh, moving on, uh, that was uh, February 25th. Well, then March the 6th, our first mission to Berlin. First time Berlin's been attacked. I was on that mission, and March, uh, and uh, yeah, March the 8th and March the 11th, I had uh, uh, seven missions over Berlin. Those were always difficult, always uh, uh, really tested, but we made them each, each time, and so uh, uh, they didn't shoot us down, but we were always damaged, badly damaged with flak. Then after uh, uh, getting on, uh, probably a, another place that was always difficult to go. Uh, every time you went there, it was just uh, you're like a sitting sitting duck because you had to come down in your your altitude, and that was uh, in Ruhr Valley, and particularly Ham. There was a uh, the ball bearing were all manufactured down the Ham Valley, so or the uh, Ruhr Valley, so we were sent in there to wake them up. But I'll tell you what, they, they were brutal to uh, uh, Berlin raid. Uh, by this time, we've been uh, hitting them pretty hard. And uh, March, May the 11th, uh, we came in from uh, Berlin and uh, landed and everything was fine. And I don't know how this happened. Somewhere in there, I fainted or collapsed or something because I wound up in the infirmary it wasn't a hospital, but the local infirmary inside the, the and uh, uh, I didn't wake up. They immediately must have put me to sleep because I didn't wake up for about uh, a good two days, three days, and my pilot came in to say goodbye because they're all through with their missions. However, I have two more to go, but they got to make me well enough to do that. So uh, they kept me in their infirmary for about uh, eight days. And that, uh, well, this particular time, I was then returned to my, my squadron, but I'm all alone because everybody else in the crew went home. Uh, so uh, I was assigned that night, May the 23rd, to go on a mission, and it turned out to be Berlin again. <laughs> so I went on that mission. And then, uh, see, I'm not assigned, so I'm the uh, radio, anyone needs a radio operator, that's me. Well. 
Anyway, the next night, they need the radio operator and Howard Rothermel in the next <coughs> uh, hut. And I both had our 29th mission in going on number 30, which would have ended our tour. So uh, the, uh, we both got called out because uh, which one of you two is going to go on this mission? And uh, they brought out a coin, flipped it in the air, and now this is 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I won it, or I, or I lost, I'm not sure which I did. But anyway, I was assigned to the mission. So I, I get out there and find that the crew I'm going to fly with, this is their first mission. So it's my last mission and their first. So uh, we uh, introduced to each other and then ready to go and we went, it was Berlin again on the 24th. So we, uh, we do complete the, uh, the tour, it was fine, we were shot up, but uh, we, uh, here we come in, now it's my last mission, our bomb bay doors, we couldn't close, we couldn't uh, uh, crank the wheel, we can, couldn't bring one of the wheels down, the uh, front wheels. Um, there was uh, just damage like that, but it wasn't uh, severe enough to do any particular damage as far as the, uh, uh, any risks are concerned. So any, anyway, we landed and we cranked the wheel down, by the way, it, uh, it, we didn't land on, on just one wheel, we had two. But anyway, uh, and then uh, um, oddly enough, the command car was out waiting for me at my heart stand to take me in for debriefing. And I thought, well, gee, this is the first time that happened. The rest of the time, we always had a truck to go in. Well, anyway, then uh, after debriefing, the command car took me to my squadron. And bear in mind now, I'm all alone because everybody is gone. But he uh, told me to be ready tomorrow because I'm going to be, I, I need, I'll be assigned at Barry St. Edmonds. So the next morning I was ready and all my gear and everything went over to Bury St. Edmunds. They um, uh, had a nice little ceremony, awarded my DFC and so on. But the, uh, uh, gave me my assignment now was to be an instructor at Levenham, which was a uh, B-24 base being converted now, they're in the third division, so they're going to pick. Uh, they're going to get these B-17s, replace their B-24s, and I'm going to instruct them on the B-17 radio. And I get uh, there, and uh, that was a, that was a nice uh, way to rest, <laughs> because those people all knew all about the radio, and they were they were pretty good uh, bunch of people. They were real good people. I like them. But anyway, uh, from uh, I'll tell you this. I was given that two, two a week delay en route on my way from my base to Lavenham, which was about eight miles away. <laughs> I, I have two weeks to get there. So I went into London, and by this time, uh, I was uh, awed by what, happened, by what happened because London is nothing but bustle of people. Anywhere you go, even Piccadilly Circus and Trafalgar Square, we always stayed in Trafalgar Square. But there were so many people. But here, there was nobody on the streets. Nobody. And we have 72 countries that represent the Allies, and not one of the soldiers, nobody was on the, uh, the uh, streets except the MPs. Over 500 MPs stopped me <laughs> within two days wondering what I'm doing here when everybody else is grounded. I had to show my orders. Anyway, they understood. So I hopped a train and I went to Edinburgh and uh, stayed up there uh, for the rest of the time. It's a good place to go because it's good R&R &R and plenty of food and bed and so on. But uh, come to find out the reason I was grounded or everybody was grounded, uh, D-Day was being planned. Nobody understood it as D-Day. We didn't know that uh, anything like that was going to happen. There was nothing except this people gone to even hint there was going to be something coming up. But that's what it was. It was uh, so um, then I reported back to my, uh, my base at Levenham, and there I stayed until uh, uh, till, uh, there was a point. Then a, I was there roughly three months. 
And then I went to uh, a replacement center in Blackpool, England. And now I'm waiting for, um, because I'm being reassigned to a job back in the States, which I didn't know what it was, but it was there. But anyway, uh, at uh, uh, Blackpool, uh, it's, a, it's a resort area and it was really a nice place to, to be. And I was there waiting for some in next instruction. And what they were trying to do is get me right home, whether it be on an airplane, B-17, B-24, or the ship. It turned out to be a ship, the New Amsterdam. On that uh, ship, the, uh, uh, when we finally boarded, there was only 20 Americans on board. There was uh, 500 Canadians going on furlough back to Canada and there was uh, 1,500 British soldiers guarding 10,000 German prisoners. So these, so, so we, we start heading back to, uh, to the States. Anyway, we got to the, uh, uh, to the harbor, New York Harbor, and these Germans had been told that uh, the Statue of Liberty and the Empire State, Bu State Building had been bombed. So these 10,000 German prisoners pile up on that side of the boat, and there they see there's no damage to either one. So now they know. Anyway, we landed and uh, everything was fine. I eventually uh, went back to um, uh, Michigan, right from there, uh, where I was uh, to spend my 30 days. Prior to going uh, my 30 days R&R, &R, that's coming up. But anyway, when we uh, got there, I, I had my uh, girlfriend, there at the time, my blind date, by the way. But uh, we were uh, already planning our planning to get married, but not then. So uh, uh, we're going down to Gene Clock Park, which is on Lake Michigan. And uh, this GI truck pulled in front of us. I said, well, what's a GI truck doing here? We don't have a base around here. And she says, well, that's the German prisoners going down to the beach. I, that's what I said, and they. Uh, it turns out that they they pick fruit and so on in the morning from six to two, in the morning six to two six in the morning two in the afternoon, and then they get to go to the beach for two hours. And she says that's not all. She says they also have dances for them every Saturday night. So, <laughs> my my uh, recollection of what, what an MP was or a, a POW was going through in Germany was much different than this here. I couldn't believe they were doing this. But uh, it, it turned, about, turned out to be fine. It, uh, they were nice people, good people, and uh, they weren't fighting the war. They were so glad to be over where we were rather than where they were before. So it, it, was, it worked out fine for everybody. So that uh, was uh, some of the excitement. One of the things that did happen, I, uh, uh, this, my, my aunt, who's about my age, um, met a girl, young girl, pretty young girl, and uh, they liked each other, and so Joyce invited them over for, uh, invited her over to uh, make some candy, you know, fudge type, type stuff. And she, uh, she sees my picture there, and she asks, who is this? And Joyce says, well, that's Russ. Uh, well, I, why didn't you write to him? So she said, well, I'm already writing to a bunch of boys. And she's a junior in high school at the time. And she, uh, uh, no, now she's a senior, sorry. She's a senior in high school at the time. Anyway, she said, well, I'm already writing to a lot of boys, but I'll write it, drop him a line. Well, she did. And it was a real nice letter, and I answered it and so on. When I, uh, another thing that happened, uh, we were, when we were uh, we left, left basic training, we went over to Fort Myers, Florida. They were building a gunnery school at Fort Myers. And so we had to go over and help build this, and that uh, build this base, and that including chopping down the trees, digging out the roots. Uh, they had garfish and all uh, along the Everglades, you had to go in and get them out of there, did all that. And eventually you had the base prepared and then we went into gunnery school which included 
the shotgun first and then uh, armament of different types and eventually the 50 calibers. And they mounted these 50 calibers uh, on a post and uh, they've got a bank out there with a truck running behind it pulling a sock and you're to shoot at it, the sock. Well anyway, uh, we uh, were signed and they had, we had six of these put up and mine, when I was shooting, it snapped. 52,000 pounds recoil came back and got me in the mouth and teeth and sent me flying for about 35 feet. Uh, we're in excellent condition, I'll tell you. It didn't, uh, so I got this here, wound up back there and uh, was able to get up. So no records of this are, uh, plenty of witnesses, but no records kept because I got up, first of all, we're a brand new base, they don't want any accidents reported, so on and so forth. So uh, what I ran into though was my teeth. Now I needed dental work. So every place I went, I had uh, uh, eventually 28 fillings. Uh, they had no pills for calcium, but I had to take a lot of calcium, so I was assigned milk, a lot of milk to drink. Uh, what I'm getting at is this. Uh, all through this time, we're, we're now in Nebraska and we're uh, uh, preparing to go overseas. Well, anyway, uh, I'm getting this dental work done. And during this particular day, we went, drove, uh, we flew down to Cuba and back as a training mission. And we got back at five minutes to six and the truck was waiting for us, telling us our, our uh, Overseas furlough starts in five minutes. So uh, I'm going to Michigan. We're in Harvard, Nebraska. It's out in the sticks. There is no any transportation. Uh, anyway, um, we're all making plans now real quickly to go back. But I can't go now. My teeth won't be ready till tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided to go home anyway. So I went, uh, finally got home the next, <coughs> next day, and I uh, uh, went around visiting relatives and so on. And then on Thursday, I called Shirley in the morning and uh, said, uh, Shirley, I thought I'd let you know I'm Russ and I'm home. She says, I know it. <laughs> I think I was supposed to call her first that I didn't do that. <laughs> but anyway, I asked her to go out. Uh, Wing King was, um, the band that's going to be out at Crystal Palace, and uh, so I asked her if she wanted to go dance. So she said, "Sure." So I show up at her house Friday night to pick her up, and it's dark outside, and uh, I come up with a big smile. <laughs> she goes running in the house. She tells her mother she can't go out with me because I have no teeth. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, I. Uh, we, we would, I tell you this, I knew within five minutes I was going to marry her. There was no question, just that much was revealed about her that I really liked and so I, and she was cute as a bug's ear. She was only uh, four foot eleven and I'm almost six foot, within half an inch of six foot. But she was a doll, she was so great and a good person, just a real nice person. <laughs> We danced, and that that did it. Our, our dancing, we just danced. We great, uh, a lot of dancing. I can go on and on about that because that was uh, that was a good way for us to get along. Get, by the way, I was um, I knew a lot of people there, and of course, graduated from high school there. And I I tell you, there was a lot of people at this dance that I knew, and many of them, the girls, they won't wondering why I'm not coming over to dance with them, which I always did at the high school. But uh, my little bombshell here <laughs> was a little jealous, I could tell that right away. So um, we uh, were then, um, uh, well, we, we had a just great time, we took her home and so on and so forth. And then I saw her, I was, uh, I was home for 30 days and so we got real, acquainted and then then I went to uh, uh, Florida for 30 days and then I was getting my reassignment now and that was up to uh, Madison, Wisconsin and I was to take over one of the 
five buildings there, training buildings, where we had 2,000 students each, each building, and uh, I had 458 uh, instructors. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I got that building. Well, there isn't much to do. They, they've been doing all this all the time, and there was never a problem to, uh, for me to get involved in. So I was there till the end of the war. But uh, while there, I, uh, I'm in love with my girl friend now, so I, uh, the captain says, uh, Russ, you, you've got a week's vacation coming from last year, now it's 1945. You, if you don't take it before the end of February, you'll lose it. So I said, well, just a minute. So I called Shirley and I said, will you marry me? And she says, when? <laughs> <laughs> so I told her the story, and uh, <coughs> she arranged the wedding, and it turned out to be February 14th, <laughs> Valentine's Day. Right. We didn't even think about Valentine's Day. Okay. We didn't know. They had the worst uh, ice storm, uh, one of the worst they've ever had. And so after the wedding, we uh, were going to take the bus into Morrison Hotel in Chicago for our honeymoon. Well, anyway. We were late now because of the uh, storm, and so we uh, called the bus station. Would you hold the bus up for us, and we'll be right there. Well, they, there was no problem because they were just as soon get off the highway for now anyway. So it worked out. But when we went down, we took uh, all this cake and fed it to everybody on the bus. <laughs> Give them all a piece of cake. But it was fun. Right. Really had a good time. I, uh, I, I went to uh, Valparaiso where they had a technical school and uh, we, uh, uh, by this time I'm married and had a family, started and so on and so forth. So I, was, I went to college for two years and uh, got my, uh, uh, well, I didn't quite finish school because um, I went to Chicago to look into a job with GE and uh, GE, however, uh, wanted to send me down to Brazil. <laughs> I didn't want to go to Brazil. So I was uh, in the phone booth and there's a little uh, kind of a display there from IBM and I went the phone number so it's a Saturday morning. Nobody's at IBM except I called them and uh, guy answered he said come on over right now. So I went over and he hired me. They hired me right away and uh, that was Saturday quite now. So I went over and he hired me. They hired me right away. And uh, that was Saturday. Called me on Sunday and told me I, would to be, I was to be in, in uh, New York Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said I couldn't make it because I had a home in Valparaiso. I had to close it up. So I, I closed it up and I, I arrived in uh, New York on Tuesday morning then.